Hi there, I am Dr. Deeksha Pandey and you are watching Urogynecology for Beginners. Mm. Today we are going to talk something related to surgery and surgical training. And not for us, for the trainees, for residents in obstetrics and gynecology and also for the fellows. And this is not what I feel or I am saying to you. Actually, the whole issue, one full issue, Journal of Gynecologic Surgery has dedicated to the training of OBG residents and fellows in related subspeciality. It is published just this month, so very fresh it is. And there are nine articles written by various authorities in the field who are actually the mentors for various training programs. And initially, the articles are about training, surgical training in OBG residents and then they have also talked about the exposure of surgical training or surgical learning for fellows as in gynecological oncology, in urogynecology or reconstructive surgery and also in the field of RMS that is reproductive medicine or infertility. There are various challenges which they have highlighted and they have also tried to show some way forward which together if implemented we can really change the surgical exposure and surgical training of our trainees whether it is a gynecology resident or it is a fellowship training. I felt it was very interesting and I hope you will also like it. There were many things which I thought till now that only I think that way and no one else may be even thinking about it but it was a big relief to know that other people also are feeling this lack of um, training of OBG residents and there are many more if you go towards the end of this session you will realize the last article especially which I liked the most because I felt there were things like that I was never able to put it in words or in sentences or in paragraphs or to give it a voice. I was happy that we are not the me and my friends are not the only people who think like that. The same things are happening across the globe as far as the field and the surgical speciality, such important subspeciality that caters the health needs of women is concerned. And I want your opinion. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And what is your extra opinion to change to bring a paradigm shift in this training program for residents and fellows. But before we move on to the session, I once again want to invite you for our conference, which is going to happen, which is just one month away on 21st and 22nd of January of the coming year, that is 2023. And all of you are invited there. Hope to see all of you soon. If you want to know more about the registration links, we have already started sending them out, but if you have not received it, I'll be posting it one registration link in the description box below. But if you have not received it yet, or if you have any problem opening that link, please, you can mail me directly to manipaleurogynecology at gmail.com and we'll try to reply you as soon as possible. So let's start the session today. So, I decided to read the special issue of Journal of Gynecological Surgery published just this month in December 2022. It spontaneously attracted my attention as this special issue is entitled Gynecological Surgery Training. There are a total of nine articles in this issue which talk about various surgical training like surgical training in obstetrics, in reproductive medicine or infertility, gynecology and also in urogynecology. I have picked up around 4-5 or five articles which were intriguing to me to discuss with you all. The very first article is entitled The Decline in Surgical Education – Unintended Consequences touches upon some of the historical events which happened in the training of obstetrics and gynecology. So American Board of OBG, that is ABOG, 
was formed in the year 1930 that means around 100 years ago officially that was the time when these two distinct field obstetrics and gynecology were unified and made into one specialty later in 1970s which is around 50 years ago or 50 years after the obg became as one subject sub specialties started being recognized by american board of obstetrics and gynecology and after that you know how we have diversified into oncology into urogynecology into minimally invasive surgery so on and so forth so as a result what has happened in last few years the author is trying to describe which has reduced the amount of surgical training for the trainees is like newer medical and conservative surgical treatments we have started adopting so definitely there is less and less surgical exposure to the residents and resident supervision has become more stringent with the resulting reduction in resident independence minimally invasive surgeries in gynecology have increased the surge complexity of surgical training definitely when everybody is doing laparoscopies and hysteroscopies the trainees are getting less and less chances to perform the routine surgeries which are done from abdomen or by the vaginal route increased emphasis is being given these days for faculty clinical productivity what does it mean that medical teachers are just not only medical teachers they are supposed to perform good at clinical level we talk about patient statistics we should have we should have more and more number of patients so definitely there is less time to teach and train students and add on to it is increased number of surgical fellows with increasing need or increasing fellowship programs we are having less and less surgical exposure for the pgs or residents as far as surgical training is concerned now one more thing there is now uh, for many years there is some work or restriction on residents again when you restrict work you get less exposure so all these factors together has definitely led to decrease amount of surgical training as it used to be in earlier days the author states here very clearly that surgical training is not easy training in surgery should be a foundation that the surgeon or the resident then builds on with experience mentorship and adaptation to new technology it is a long long curve this process varies from one individual to the next but in author's opinion and i feel it is definitely true it takes at least 5 to 10 years to solidify surgical skill sets and judgment and that should continue to develop even better experience during your surgical career it is true that i'm still learning every day i do a surgical case or i interact with the patient learning never stops i'm still learning new and new things every day moving forward was the next article which is entitled gynecological surgical training current and future perspectives the first line of this article states that pelvic anatomy and pelvic surgery are complex and sophisticated a very very true statement however as we had discussed earlier in the earlier article that it is noted clearly that expectations from gynecological surgical training has suffered greatly for various reasons and the reasons have been discussed in the article earlier in detail Megrina in his 2014 presidential address at the American Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopist that is AAGL called for separating obstetrics and gynecological residency training into different 
residency programs. It was first time I read the sentence, I knew about it. Actually, till now, I thought I'm the only one who thinks that obstetrics and gynecology are very different from each other and must be separated as different or separate entities or residency programs. This is a note about vaginal hysterectomy where the author correctly says that vaginal hysterectomy has been the signature operation for the gynecologic surgeons. The national trend of vaginal route for hysterectomy is decreasing. And it is not only about US. I think it is everywhere. At least in India, the story is the same. Emphasis on the vaginal route during training is required. But who is more suited for this role more than female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery that is FPMRS specialist? FPRMS is also now a recognized subspecialty since 2011. Today, we are in the era of laparoscopic and robotic surgeries. However, we must remember that vaginal hysterectomy is our signature operation and we must try to perform it more frequently and teach our trainees the art of vaginal surgery more and more frequently. As we started talking about female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, let's discuss what is happening in the training programs in this subspecialty. So first the need and as we always talk about the need is immense. The prediction says that by the year 2050, which is not even 30 years away from today, 43.8 million women only in America will be affected by one or more pelvic floor disorders requiring a consultation and most probably a surgical treatment by a person trained in urogynecology or female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. One is left to wonder, with such a steep drop in vaginal hysterectomies being performed, does this not only affect resident training, but also fellow preference and training in FPMRS program? The answer is definitely yes. In the present day OBG residency program, we are not training and even exposing the residents enough for urogynecological surgeries so that they can make a fair choice to take FPMRS as a subspecialty later on because we have to meet the need of patients in time which is going to become immense so we have to train people for that. A case logbook database to analyze trends in resident hysterectomy volume over a 16-year duration found that the resident log vaginal hysterectomies decrease by 35.5%, which is more than one-third in a time frame of 16 years. If this trend continues, recent FPRMS graduates or urogynecology fellows might have increased comfort with and thus a preference for performing laparoscopy and robotic hysterectomies compared to vaginal hysterectomy. The directors rated only 20% of first-year fellows as being able to perform vaginal hysterectomy independently and similarly only 46% being able to perform abdominal hysterectomy independently which is sort of a shame or embarrassment for us, the trainers. Trainees should ideally be exposed to all modalities of surgery so that their skill set span the spectrum of surgical approaches and so they can engage in shared decision making to tailor the best surgery for each individual patient. Very true it is because we should have, I always believe that we must have all the instruments in our armamentarium and it should not be a skill-driven decision that because I can do this hysterectomy better or this procedure by this route better, so I will do for this patient. 
it should be the opposite way around we should have all the skills and then we should see that what is best for my patient so says the conclusion of this article that as specialist in fpmrs it has become increasingly important to emphasize strong basic minimally invasive surgical techniques overall the field of this sub speciality should embrace all forms of technology for helping patient but should remain aware of the role of uno gynecologist should play in educating next generation of trainees on a variety of routes including conventional laparoscopic robotic assisted laparoscopic and vaginal surgery and this is the last article of the special issue the pay gap in gynecological surgery and its effect on training quality i was about to stop here however when i started reading it to see let me see what the author wants to say i thought this is maybe the most important article of the entire show so i would like to read this also with you i first read just the abstract the wage gap in gynecological surgery presents what we have described as double discrimination that means lower pay in the area of surgery that boast for the largest proportion of female surgeons and potentially lower quality care with fewer resources for the fields which is exclusively of female patients this article expounds on this premise and describes how this pay gap translates to fewer resources and less training for gynecological surgery residents solutions and ways forwards towards reform and equity are proposed so i started getting interested in it and i thought of not leaving this article also and trust me it is an interesting read the first question is why is women's health undervalued there have been multiple studies and research work to answer this question and the authors of these articles found that the rates for some procedures for women are set lower than similar procedures for men without any medically justifiable reason for this disparity more recent studies show some reduction in these disparities yet there is still persistent undervaluation of gynecological surgery and this is my questions to all of you who are listening this tell me your experience do you also feel that the procedures like treatment of stress urinary incontinence or prolapse surgery or cystoscopy if it is done by a gynecological surgeon the code is lesser than when it is done by a urologist actually i was thinking that it is in my head only and maybe it is the story of one or two institutions because i keep on talking to my colleagues and my friends and they also had the same thought about it however i think it's true and it is very disheartening to complete the picture severe underfunding for research into women's health issues contributes to inequity not only in access to and development of new treatments but also resources and hospital systems that may be influenced by research dollars now as far as modern indian scenario is concerned i do not agree with this too much because i think our research agencies and government is providing a lot of support in reproductive health care of maternal and child well being there are many grants specifically meant to that and they are promoting women researchers are a lot however i do not have a statistics to prove or disprove this fact but this is just a feeling however i can totally understand and relate to the next sentence which says that as evidence of effects of these disparities many department in obg are lost leaders in their hospital system we are a lot told that obg department is the lost leader or you will understand it is going in laws other departments are performing so well though the numbers are huge 
though the surgeries are complicated however there are multiple factors that we are still shown as the loss leaders tell me what is your situation in this matter but how does all this affect trainees as today we are talking about trainees women's healthcare practices are incentivized to focus primarily on obstetrics by billing rates with only 15% of any typical practice devoted to gynecological surgery and i think it is very true in our setup too i do not have confirmed sources to say this or to refute this but i have overheard people saying that in our setup also the statistics which is mainly focused is of obs rather than whatever you are doing in gynecology does not account that much as is the number of delivery historically when obstetrics was merged with gynecological surgery many leaders objected to the truncation of surgical training from 5 years to 18 to 24 months and the allocation of only 15% of any practice to surgery critics at the time contended that all who open the belly should have a broad surgical skill required to handling all problems encountered there regardless of organ system involved i feel this is very important so in the present scenario when in obg training around 85% time is dedicated to training the trainee related to childbirth and only 15% of the time he or she is trained in gynecological surgery studies have shown that graduating obg residents may be unprepared to practice surgical gynecology independently just crying over it and criticizing the present scenario will not be enough what should be our way forward the authors here have given some solution which i am reading directly from the article so they say that more funding for women's health is needed on a federal level whatever system exists to set reimbursement must take account of systemic discrimination that might result directly or downstream as educators we should feel doubly incensed by the lack of resources in women's health as this directly impacts the quality of training we can provide and yes yet another solution is fellowship training after residency and this is very interesting which i am going to read now a recent study showed that two year fellowship in gynecological surgery is potentially equivalent to 19 years of practice that's really encouraging so if you do post residency training for two years with a good mentor it is equivalent to 19 years of practice so why not promote it and to conclude it all we cannot continue with the status quo our patients and our trainees deserve a solution that is developed by our leadership in collaboration with legislators to address historic and systemic wrongs solutions for systemic discrimination this complex requires all of us healthcare professionals trainees and patients to come together and create change so that we can ensure adequate resources for all women i think this issue was an eye opener as far as training in gynecologic surgery is concerned and for me definitely this was a thought provoking idea because till now i thought i am the only one maybe thinking in this direction but yes it reinforces that people across the globe there are many like me which are thinking that this residency training is not enough in gynecology surgery and there are various definite reasons for that and all the leaders in the world in gynecology surgery must come forward and do something about it so let's start with this point today